Good evening. You, we are on the air live from Clearwater. This is Picture This. I'm Ted Froberg. Our hosts this evening are Jeff Donald and Lou Donald and myself. Yes, Good evening. it is, Ted. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you. And um, if you're listening to our show this evening, that means you're not watching the 55th annual Grammy Awards show on TV. And we just want to say thank you for choosing us. And, uh, well, you were telling me earlier this evening um, that uh, actually you got a call from some NFL officials a week or so ago. Well, our inaugural uh, show was supposed to be last week, as you know. Right, right. Last Sunday, but we pushed it back. We pushed it back. We got a call from the NFL, and they said, look, guys, we're doing this show called a Super Bowl. And, really? Yeah. That was last Sunday? That was last oh, Sunday. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we'd like... We'd appreciate it if you kind of push your show back a week so that we can have more viewership. So we said, yeah, why not? Yeah, that was, that was nice of you, Ted. I think that was a good move on your part. I'm surprised Taylor Swift hasn't called me tonight and said, hey, look. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably a good point. Yeah. So what are we going to talk about tonight? What, what's, what, what do we have on the uh, schedule? Well, since this is our beginning show, why don't we talk about uh, beginning photography? That would seem to work well. All right. So... Are you a beginning photographer? Well, I was at one time, yeah. 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 Lou, what about you? you? You've probably been around a little while. <laughs> For those that don't know, um, um, Lou is my uh, oldest brother. Right. So he's, he's got like 10 years on me, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't we start by introducing ourselves? I mean, uh, we're going to talk a lot about an organization you'll hear us mention, the FCCP, the Florida Center for Creative Photography. And um, so why don't we uh, tell the folks what that's all about? And I suppose that's the cue for me to jump in here and uh, explain that. And uh, um, and and that's that's the organization that's making all this possible right now. Um, the uh, Florida Center for Creative Photography was uh, basically founded about ten years ago. Um, I, I started a photo club in uh, January of two thousand and three uh, at the Dunedin Fine Arts Center when I was teaching photography there, and. Um, keep a long story short, um, this is uh, the offshoot of it 10 years later. And uh, uh, we've got uh, currently about, uh, um, we're, actually we're just under 1,600 members uh, in the group. And membership is free. You can go to our website, www.flccp.org. And that's FL and then C for Center, C for Creative, P for Photography, dot org. Um, and uh, you can check us out there. And uh, we're, we're the most active photography organization um, in certainly the Tampa Bay area, but we use a uh, social media uh, network called Meetup to power our website. They provide us with a calendar and a framework for creating events and all these things. And um, out of uh, 112,000 uh, Meetup groups in the, uh, uh, in the world, uh, we're not the most active meetup in the world, but we are the most active photography group um, in the world. In so, the world. Yeah, that's pretty nice. That's impressive. Right here in greater Tampa Bay. Right here. Right here. In River City. <laughs> well, I don't know about River <laughs> City, maybe Bay City. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's my story. I'm, I'm the director of this organization. And... Uh, so, Ted, what brings you to the table? Well, you invited me for one thing, and uh, I, I guess I'm here because I'm uh, technically my I'm the uh, chairman of the Creative Advisory Board. And that's uh, a good title. Yeah, I like that title. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Lou is here because well, well, I don't know. You'd better ask him. Why are you here, Lou? <laughs> well, I've uh, geez, I started in photography at 13, and um, ended up uh, working in camera stores, commercial departments with the high-end commercial stuff, doing wedding and event photography and various forms of photography. And I'm old enough to say that uh, that pretty much makes it 50 years of photography. Mm. Yeah, and I think if we probably went around the table, we've, uh, you know, uh, you can look at my brother with 50 years, and I have I got into it a little later. I, I was uh, um, uh, late teen. And uh, so that that puts me with thirty plus years. <laughs> and uh, Ted, I think you might have a year or two in there too. So yeah, my father introduced me to photography. Really? He was a photographer, and he had some nice equipment way back in the day. And I can remember 
Um, my first experience with photography was him waking me up in the middle of the night to go out and shoot a picture of some night blooming something or other. I don't know what exactly what it was, but cactus plant or something. Wow. Until. And that was here in Florida? That was here in Florida. Right. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to talk about some old, uh, well, not old cameras this week, but uh, um, we're going to talk about buying cameras. Is that what you want, want to talk about? Sounds good to me. All right. Yeah. And uh, so um, first time buyers. Yeah. Um, when, and, and I've got, like, like Lou, a, a background in, in the camera industry. Mm. Uh, uh, I was in management for Ritz Camera for about five, six years. And uh, before they went bankrupt, I, I left Ritz in 2001 when um, was right at the transition of the digital era. But I can still put on my salesman's hat and, uh, uh, you know, talk about these things. Mm -hmm. But so first time buyers, if I were to put my salesperson's hat back on and uh, talk about that, you know, my style of um, talking to customers was to uh, ask questions uh, and find out really what their needs were and the type of pictures they wanted to take and try to match their needs and their style of photography or what they envisioned it to be and match what I felt would be, you know, the best camera for their needs. Mm -hmm. Lou, how did, how did you kind of deal with that? Well, service? I was probably very similar to that and, and talked with them to a certain extent about what their aspirations were. Right. So that, um, in a sense, trying to give them something to grow into that is not going to limit them six months or a year later going, why did I buy that camera? Sure, sure. Um, but I also think that today it's pretty tough for people to find a salesman oh, that yeah. is going to look at them that way. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. You know, they're, they're likely to be in a big box store with sure. electronics. And the help that you're going to get, I, I hate to say it, is probably somewhat limited. Sure. Which puts it back on that new photographer to do some homework for what they're looking for. Right, right. And, and also, a lot of people are introduced to photography through their cell phone these days. Uh, the, the, the smartphones, the cell phones have built-in cameras, and uh, that's where they get started. Well, and, and, and in all honesty, um, you know, the current generations of cell phones are pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, the resolution, the apps that come built in, you know, personally, I think that uh, the Japanese could, you know, take some lessons from Apple and Nokia and some of these companies and what they're doing. But, um, you know, I, I read an interview just this past week with a, uh, a Japanese, uh, I think it was a senior vice president for Casio, which while Casio is not a big company, you know, in camera sales in the U.S., but in the Asian market, they're, they're, they're right up there. And uh, this guy, gentleman, was saying that, you know, they're, they're staying the course. They think the point-and-shoots are here to stay. And yeah, um, it was an interesting read, but I, I, I just don't see it happening in the United States. Yeah. And, and, of course, we're a huge market. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I really think cell phones are um, going to replace the entry-level point-and-shoots. The only drawback to them that I see with current technology is they lack a decent optical zoom lens. Right. But when you look at the Nokia, I think it's the Nokia 808, they came out with that. It's a 40-plus megapixel camera in mm. a cell phone. Mm. So when you start cropping in on it, you've still got lots of pixels left. Mm. So in a computer, you can produce some pretty nice images. The... Uh, most of the major websites, dpreview.com and uh, some of the other ones, have reviewed the camera, and the sample images out of it are pretty amazing for a cell phone. Yeah, yeah. Um, far exceeding what what a, what what a lot of the point and shoots are doing. Right, and as sensors become uh, better with higher resolution, then then the telephoto aspect of it, uh, I mean, that covers the telephoto aspect. It it does to a degree, but but you know the the real downside that I see in um, uh, to the cell phone cameras is in low light. Yeah, these little sensors that the cell phone. I mean, you can pack a lot of pixels in there, but um, low light 
they the pictures start to really fall apart. They're, right, and they're it, noisy, grainy, whatever you want to call that. And that's another thing about cell phones that they don't have a tripod mount built into them, and uh, a lot of people in low light would would it would require using a tripod for yeah. the study of the camera. And even even as weak as the flash is on a small point and shoot <laughs> compared to a real flash or you know even the built-in flash on an SLR um the cell phones don't have near the power of what a, even a point and shoot camera has in terms of adding light sure that's because they lack the battery power yeah, yeah. amongst other things it's right. to keep it compact sure but yeah. um you know getting back to your tripod thing you know there's come about because of the popularity of these smartphones principally the iPhone a number of add-on accessories, accessory lenses, all kinds of things. And um, one of the most popular accessories is a case or bracket that fits the phone. And guess what? It has a tripod oh. socket. Oh, I thought you were so, going to say it was a telephoto attachment. No, they've got um, wide-angle attachments. They have fisheye attachments. They have macro attachments, telephoto attachments. Mm -hmm. um, we were out with the group. Uh, and we were on a uh, photo walk or field trip. We call them photo walks, but just to let everybody in on it. Uh, we were at um, Wall Springs, uh, the Pinellas County Park up in Palm Harbor. Um, I believe it was a week ago today. And one of the members had an adapter that fits on their iPhone that was attaching to a Leica spotting scope. Oh. And, well, the Leica spotting scope is probably couple grand yeah just just off the top of my head could right. be a little more so i mean these aren't bad optics but they're not designed as camera optics right but the case um you know made it up turned turned the cell phone you know the 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 iphone on and went to the camera mode and the woman that was using that had just some stunning images mm. i was extremely impressed by what an eight megapixel cell phone can do one attached to a two thousand dollar lens, <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody ought to go out and buy one. Oh, I mean, sure. that seems the simple solution to Absolutely. me. Absolutely, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but getting back to purchasing cameras, and um, you, you know, I mean, yeah, I, like, like Lou said, um, you 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 try to probe the customer, so to speak, and um, uh, figure out what their needs are. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would show them a couple cameras and. Um, uh, move on from 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 that position and really try to, to um, you know narrow down their choices. One of the funny stories that I tell about being in the camera industry was, um, you know, you'd have a husband and a wife typically walk into the store, and um, you know they're looking at cameras, and I'd walk up, you know, can I help you? And and the husband he would be looking at the biggest SLR we had in the store. The most buttons, the most dials, you know, and and the thing would be over a thousand dollars, and and that's in the film era where there weren't too many cameras over a thousand dollars, and in the meantime, the wife would be looking at all these nice little point and shoots that would fit in her diaper bag or in her purse, and and so you know you could see that right away we weren't going to meet very easily. So I would, you know, my first thing would be, okay, who's the picture taker in the family? Mm -hmm. You know, and the husband would point to the wife and all this stuff. So I'd go, uh, well, you know what? We got some new cell phones in. Would you like to go take a look at those? And, and it was like a two-year-old that got cell phones? Oh, let me look at the cell phones. And he's off in the corner of the room looking at cell phones. Yeah. So then I could talk to her. Right. And she had no interest in the camera he picked out for her. You know, it was like... Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And so, you know, we would start talking about it, and we would get her into a nice point-and-shoot, and that was exactly what she would. Because my point is, if you buy that camera, but you hate it, you're not going to take any pictures. It's more important that you love your camera, because then you'll take it with you, mm -hmm. and then you'll take lots of pictures, and you'll be becoming a better photographer, and that's that's the road to success, so to speak. Very good. So that was always my philosophy. And, right. You know, get the man out of the picture. <laughs> well, to a certain extent, but I, I also always believed that it depends on what they wanted to use the camera for. If it's just for family events and things like that, the pocketability 
and ease of using a point and shoot, that's the right camera. Sure. As soon as they start talking about going beyond that is when you start thinking about should this person be in an SLR. Right, right, right. right. And, uh, well, let me uh, take a, not, not a break here, but uh, if you want to call in on this topic, maybe you have a question on buying cameras, uh, maybe you're looking for a first time or second time uh, purchase, give us a call locally at 727 441 3000 and toll free, it's 1 866 826 1340. And uh, you can also uh, email us. Uh, it is uh, questions dot no FCC oh, FCCP dot, dot questions, questions at gmail dot, dot com. com. Right. Would help if I read my own notes. Probably <laughs> trying to do this from memory. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So feel free. Give us a call. Shoot us an email if you don't want to be on the air. And um, we'll be doing some contests here. We'll be, you know, for callers, we could probably come up with a prize or something to give away. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, you can have Ted's minivan for a week. That would be the first prize, I think. Well, I, don't, I don't think my wife would appreciate that. <laughs> really? really? I'm shocked to learn this. I am shocked. Okay. So um, back to cameras. Back to cameras. Um, so we talked about cell phone cameras. What types of uh, features on, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they... When they see me taking a picture, they say, "Oh, how many megapixels does that camera have?" So, and that's generally what what people tend to r- relate to when they're when they're buying a camera. Is how many megapixels does that thing have? Yeah, and I don't think that's the biggest thing in the world. Right, I you agree. Know. Yeah, um, it shouldn't be how many megapixels you can pack into a tiny little chip and a point and shoot. It should be. Um, more image quality in terms of lower noise, exactly. okay, um, and some of the other features on the camera in terms of perhaps its its flash and some things like that. How does it work in low light? Yep. Does it have an ISO uh, setting on that? Custom white balance, that that type of thing. Yeah, uh, you know, those are all nice features. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, 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 yeah, I mean, back to the original, you know, is, is, are megapixels really important? You know, American buyers want to quantify things down to, you know, give me a number and I'll go and, you know, pick that out and that's the one I want. So, you know, we tend to gravitate towards that megapixel number. But um, And in the early days of digital, it did make a difference, you know, whether you were at three megapixel or four, five, six, and... Um, but uh, today, if you've got anything 8 megapixel and up, and what do most people do with their pictures today? Unfortunately, I mean, it's not me personally, but unfortunately, for most people, it's putting a picture up on Facebook. And if that's what you're doing, um, cell phones work great, yeah. little point and shoots work great. But, um, you know, back to the megapixel thing, um, the bottom line is it'd be like buying a car based only on the horsepower. Yeah. So it's really not, you know, as, as you and Lou both kind of said, it's not as important as you might think. If, if you're above 8 megapixel, you can get some nice 8x10s if you want to print them, um, but they'll look great on the web as well. Mm-hmm. That's the bottom line. You know, and for a lot of people, it really can be the zoom range. And rather than how much telephoto they get, how much wide angle do you get? And that's a lot of people. I mean, that's a, that's something a lot of people overlook is is the wide angle. They they want to mm-hmm. zoom in as far as possible. I think, but um, the wide angle I think is is more attractive. I think than than telephoto sometimes. Well, I, I think as you become more experienced, it is. But I think um, when people initially think about buying a camera, it's usually for first time events related to either you know boy we're getting married i want a nice camera for the honeymoon um it's you know we got a new baby or the first baby and these kind of things and so a lot of times they think in terms of wanting to get close to the subject Mm -hmm. and i I can remember back when i was selling cameras one of the things i always used to say was you know people would go gee do i really need that 70 to 300 millimeter lens couldn't I get by with a 200 millimeter lens or this or that? And I'd go, you know what? I've sold a lot of 300 millimeter zooms. No one's ever brought it back and said, you know what? I don't want this. I get too close to my subject. 
<laughs> so, you know, and one of my favorite quotes, we had it on the website last yeah. week, was from Robert Kappa, who yeah. said, um, if you don't like your pictures, you weren't close enough. Yeah. So each individual, I think, is going to have their own vision. And some people tend to go more towards um, what I call urban landscapes, you know, the buildings, the cathedrals, or actual landscapes. And they'll gravitate as they get experience to the wider angle ones. But I, my personal feeling is I, I think most people initially, they need to get closer to their subject to get some interesting pictures. Fill the frame. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fill the frame with your subject. Sure. That's what's going to make it interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, um, this is probably a good point. I should talk about uh, some of the activities that we do in the group. That's and, a good idea. Um, uh, one of the things we do is every Wednesday morning, we have a meeting uh, here in Clearwater at O'Keefe's. And they're one of the friends of the show. Uh, O'Keefe's Family Tavern is at 1219 South Fort Harrison Avenue in Clearwater. Uh, they host our weekly Wednesday morning coffee and photography meeting, which is absolutely free. Just show up if you want a couple of hours of discussion. You can bring pictures to show, but um, come on out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we typically have 30 to 40 members there at our uh, uh, Wednesday morning meetings. And uh, O'Keefe's has a new rewards card. And i got to tell you, it's already saved Teresa and I uh, over $60 in meals and drinks and things like that. Sounds like and, a good uh, deal. It is. And uh, so the O'Keefe's award, award, award card is free, so... You should, uh, you know, we might stop there after the show tonight. You and Lou should pick yours up. Uh, they've got daily specials, um, and Teresa is really enjoying their new daily lunch special of uh, 500 calorie or less daily specials. Mm. And uh, Ted, I know you're watching your weight. Absolutely, that, that could be something right for you. Um, me, I like their homemade soups and their new appetizer menu. You know me, I'm a wing kind of guy. Yeah. But uh, O'Keefe's is home to one of the largest St. Patrick's Day patties in the entire southeast. And this year's party will be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They've never done a three-day party like this before. <laughs> March 15th, 16th, and 17th. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> three days of little <laughs> leprechauns running around. I don't know how we can handle that. But, uh, oh, my God. They're famous for many things, not just their St. Paddy's Day uh, uh, celebration party. Uh, they have a daily two-for-one happy hour all day, all day, every day. And uh, I, I know you and I have been there, and uh, they have some of the coldest draft beers that I know of. I like the place. It's yeah, nice place. it is. Yeah, nice, it is friend, a great place. friendly yeah. family atmosphere. Yep. So Absolutely. be sure and check out our friends, O'Keefe's Family Tavern at mm-hmm. 1219 South Fort Harrison Avenue. They're just down the street from Morton Plant Hospital in downtown Clearwater. And you do a, a, a meet-up there every Wednesday morning. Every Wednesday morning, yeah. yep. Uh, we've been doing that for over four years now. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that first, not, not all the time at O'Keefe's. We first got started at the Starbucks in downtown Clearwater. I remember. And then we moved around, but we started that in January or February of 2009. Mm-hmm. So um, it's been going on for four years. Four years now, we have a great group of people. There's a lot of learning that goes on, and um, it's all free. Come on out, have a good cup of coffee, and uh, share some uh, uh, experiences or ask some questions uh, with some fellow photographers. uh, We show images. Bring your camera. People can bring their uh, photographs and show them. Some prints if you have prints, or bring your camera, or bring pictures on uh, thumb drive. a, a thumb drive or compact flash. Yeah. I think, Jeff, you have a projector, do you? Do you yeah, use that? yeah. Oh, yeah. We have a, a digital projector, yeah. and uh, we project everything on a big screen. There you go. So I'm doing a lot of, you know, basically free education. If somebody asks a question, um, people a lot of time ask questions about Photoshop and Elements and different software. And one of our listeners has uh, just sent me an email. Uh-huh. and. uh um, uh, this person has said, great show so far, guys. Got the camera. But as a beginner hobbyist, what software would you recommend for an entry-level person? Ah. So we've been talking about beginning cameras, but the next step of digital photography is, okay, I've shot these pictures. What do I do with them? Asset management. Yep. Well, and that's actually the topic for next week's exactly. week show, but uh, there's no reason to put uh, this, uh, this, this, this listener off. So what kind of software do you use, Tim? Well, I use Photoshop myself, but I know uh, some people that like Lightroom mm-hmm. to manipulate their images. And um, 
I don't at home have a, uh, uh, any kind of software that archives the images, but uh, other than iPhoto right, on my right. MacBook. But um, I know professionally, uh, the, the office where I work during the day, my day job, um, we have a we have a program called uh, Extensus. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good program, but it's it's on the high end. It's expensive. It is. Well, yeah. I I think really in terms of software, uh, certainly mainstream and accepted is your choices between Photoshop Elements and Lightroom. Yeah, yeah. And both of those today will give you some ability to organize your photos so that you can find them. Mm-hmm. It's a question of you know price a little bit. Um, Lightroom 4 is a little more than Photoshop Elements 11. Um, Lightroom is specifically designed for photographers up to a professional level. Yep. And Photoshop Elements is geared towards the amateur photographer, but over the years it's transitioned into rather than kind of Photoshop light into a very powerful program in its own right. Mm-hmm. I use both uh, Elements and the uh, Professional Photoshop um, version, mm-hmm. and um, I think Elements is uh, is great for 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 just touching up photos and doing uh, what you yeah, want to do and printing them. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I mean, Elements certainly is Adobe's introductory program, and and in all you know, in, in keeping things kind of open, um, you know, Adobe is just one software manufacturer, so. Um, this person in in looking for a uh, a software solution, um, if you've got a PC, you've got uh, Windows Seven, Windows Eight. I think it's called Microsoft Gallery. Yeah. That's their kind of introductory program. Mm-hmm. It allows you to organize your pictures a little bit. It'll help you with the downloading or transferring the images from your camera, from your card to um, to the computer. And it has some basic image manipulation, allows some cropping, and it's got some magic tools that you kind of just click, and it'll try to fix everything for you. Red it's eye got reduction. A, it's got a tool for red eye removal right. and that kind of thing. On the Mac side, every Mac since uh, probably 10.1, something like that, iPhoto has been an integral part of it. It's matured into a pretty good uh, organizer. Um, it, too, has some... Um, uh, nice tools, nothing too sophisticated, but cropping and red eye. They've got face detection and some of those things. So those are free. You you probably have one of those on your computer, so that's certainly an option. Mm-hmm. Um, the the software that came with the camera, um, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, Panasonic, they all give you some very basic organizer developer kind of tools um you know to help with that so so you've got that as an option and that came with it you've got the adobe programs um on the free level still you've got google with picasa and it's come a long way since the very early days and it's it's um you know i i i wouldn't call it in the same league really as even iphoto yet but it's very stable now, and, and it's free. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's a possibility. And then the three Adobe programs we've mentioned. Um, and now, you know, my personal favorite, and I teach all three of them at the center. Um, and we've got members that teach them, too, at St. Pete College. And, you know, there's, there's other educational opportunities in the area. But, um, you know, f- about four years ago or so, um, I started thinking, you know, maybe I ought to put some pictures into Lightroom. And at that time, I was, you know, 99% Photoshop. I had the Mac Daddy Photoshop, you know, it was the $1,000 version, all this. And uh, the more I used Lightroom, the more I liked it. Is that right? And when it upgraded to Lightroom 3 and now Lightroom 4, um, I do 90, 95% of the work I do in Lightroom. And I'm now saying to myself, gee, if I have to take it into Photoshop, is it really, maybe I should just, you know, it's not worth my time. Maybe I should just go back and take that picture again. Is, it, is that picture really that important that I've taken into Photoshop? If I can't do it in Lightroom, it may not be worth doing. And we've heard things like that from... Um, one of the friends of the show, Clyde Butcher, 
I know when we were down at his place uh, a little over a year ago, and he was given members of the uh, uh, advisory team uh, kind of a little Photoshop lesson, yeah, yeah. That, that was his comment. If I can't fix this picture in five minutes, right. I'll go shoot it again. <laughs> no, okay, Clyde. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Clyde's getting into digital, I think, a little bit. He is. He, he is. showed us that nice camera he had. Left. Yeah, he had a uh, Canon 5D Mark II, and uh, Clyde was shooting with their uh, amazing 17-millimeter shift lens. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, cool that's a sweet lens. When I was out in Yellowstone in uh, uh, 2011, I borrowed one of those from Canon Professional Services. Wow. And that... Yeah, I just got to save my pennies. I'm only I'm only a few thousand dollars away from it. So, you know, but that's fun. Okay, so hopefully that answers your questions but uh, uh, on, on introductory software. But um, in my mind, I, I truly think most people are better served by Lightroom. And um, uh, the only reason I would really recommend um, Elements over it would be you're on a really tight budget because it is a little less money. Uh, and maybe you want to do something more than just photographs. Elements gives you a more powerful text tool. You can draw boxes and circles and shapes. So if you want to make greeting cards, you, you want to do graphics, you want to design a brochure or just a simple business card, Lightroom's really doesn't, Lightroom really doesn't have the tools to do that. But Elements could. Um, and Photoshop definitely would. I, yeah. I mean, if yeah. if I had to, I could build a website with Photoshop. Wow, but yeah. wouldn't yeah. be my first. And place. I've used Elements to do those things. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have too. Yeah. But um, you have any other questions? Well, we have a few, but I wanted to um, let people know a few things. Um, if you want to connect with us on Facebook, uh, the show will have a Facebook page uh, in a week or two. We're we're working the kinks out in that. But uh, you can uh, um, see our Facebook page for uh, the Florida Center of Creative Photography. It's www.facebook.com slash FCCP, Florida Center of Creative Photography dot org. And then, of course, the Center's website, www.flccp.org. And we've even got a Twitter account. You want to follow us on Twitter? It is twitter.com slash FCCP underscore org. So, plenty of ways to get a hold of us. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Ted will give out his personal number in a little bit. You can call him anytime <laughs> you'd like. Especially at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, your late night <laughs> photo emergencies called Ted. Um, and our number, if you want to call the show uh, locally, it's seven two seven four four one three thousand, and uh, toll free, it's one eight six six eight two six one three four zero. And uh, our email is fccp.questions, plural, questions, at gmail.com. You got it right. Hey, I got it right. Absolutely. Batting 50%. Uh, Do you want to take another question? Yeah, let's take another question. All right. We, we kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, this one came in a little, little bit ago, so I'm not doing these in order per se. But um, this is from um, Mrs. P., and her question is, lately it seems that shots I thought I had taken are not on the memory card when I get home. Um, all the shots on the card are in numerical sequence. No numbers have been skipped. Would this be a memory card issue or a camera issue? The memory card is a Lexar Professional 400X, 8 gigabyte, compact flash, UDMA. Her camera is a uh, Canon 50D. Well, let's see. Uh, assuming that she has not run out of space on the memory card, it, it could be a, a memory card issue. Uh, it could be a camera issue, but I would suggest uh, putting it... You can find out real real fast by putting in another memory card, obviously, and, and trying that and see if you still have the issue. And if you don't, then it's the memory card. Could be. Yeah, I could think... Be. That's a good quick test. What's going yeah. on is yeah. to try another memory card and see what happens. Mm -hmm. The other thing is when you say that the the uh, shots are in numerical order, is that when you're looking at them in the computer, or is that when you look at them in the camera? If it's a question when you put it in the computer that the files are there with numbers, but your programs can't open them up, then it's probably a card problem. Right. Yeah. 
yeah, th- this one's hard to di- diagnose over the uh, internet like mm. this email, but um, one of the services we offer um, here in the greater Tampa Bay area for all of our members is um, give it, give me the card. We, we have photo recovery software, and if it's a card error, um, there's an extremely high likelihood that we can recover those lost, missing pictures. But I'm, I'm more inclined to think that because the numerical sequence is in order, um, perhaps there's a bit of user error. Perhaps she's remembering pictures and thinking she took it and not seeing them. That could be. But it could also be that she has a recollection of seeing the image on the back of the camera and the image is not on the card. Mm-hmm. That's pretty strange, but um, it could happen. And, you know, but we still can't narrow it down. Could be the card, could be the camera, could, could be the card reader if you're using a reader. Even I've, I've seen similar issues with a bad USB cable mm-hmm. between the card reader and the computer. So almost any of those would be a possibility. But if you think there's missing pictures on your card, give me the card. I will, uh, anything that's there, I'll run through. I've got a couple different programs. We don't charge for it. So, you know, shoot us an email, get a hold of us at the center, and uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, get your precious photos yeah. back. But the easy and fastest way to check is to sw- simply switch out the card, use a different card, and also the USB cord if you, if yeah. you have an extra one. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that should... Try them all. Then Try you all. never know what it was. Magic but magic but, if, but if it is a defective card, this is one thing a lot of people don't know. Um, I, I cover these topics, and Lou does too, t- as teaching the uh, beginning digital photography uh, workshops, boot camps that we teach every month. Um, a lot of people don't know that those cards, and, and I mean, they're not cheap. They're not super expensive, but a 400-gigabyte card is probably a $50, $60 card. 400-gigabyte? Or, or uh, a 400X 8-gigabyte, yeah. sorry. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's probably around a 40 to $50 card. Right. Um, you can go online. It's a Lexar. So go to the Lexar site and uh, go to their, um, what, what you want to do is their customer service and get what's called an RMA, return material authorization. They're not going to ask for a receipt or anything like that. These cards all have like lifetime warranties, million picture warranties, something like that. And you can send them the card, and guess what? In a week or two, you'll get a brand new card. So why mess around with your pictures trying to diagnose it yourself? If you think you got a problem, send it back to the manufacturer. And a lot of times, can't guarantee it, but we've had members that have sent in like a one-gig card and gotten back a four- or an eight-gig card. So it's a nice little bump. Um, They just don't make one-gig cards anymore, so you're going to get an upgrade. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. You know, this is a good time to mention that if you want to hang out where Jeff, Ted, and I hang out, then head to Naughty Nancy's at 700 Eldridge Street in between North Fort Harrison and Myrtle next to the bike trail near downtown Clearwater. We found them on Urban Spoon and were wowed by their daily fresh seafood specials for lunch and dinner, dollar draft beer, and live music on the weekends. Naughty Nancy's is located right behind the Tan Talk Station, and you can join us Sunday nights for dinner before the show and enjoy the live music on the patio. Naughty Nancy's, 700 Eldridge Street in Clearwater. And I actually had dinner there this evening. You did, and I... Yeah. Uh, so did I. I, yeah. joined, I joined you. I had their chicken and broccoli uh, special. That was uh, very good. Yeah. So um, one of the features uh, that we're going to be doing every week and uh, uh, is a This Week in Photo History. And um, every week we'll uh, go back in our Wayback Machine and uh, go back in history. The time machine. Yeah, the time machine. Yeah, we do have a DeLorean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you do, Ted. Oh, well, the, the, the <laughs> flux capacitor is not working. needs to be charged? It needs to oh, be charged. Oh, man. Not enough gigawatts. So uh, we're, t- today uh, we're going to talk about a couple of photographers or important events in history that happened this pa- past week. And the first one is um, Eddie Adams uh, was on February 1st, 1968, that Eddie Adams won a Pulitzer Prize, or actually he took the Pulitzer Prize for a picture that he took in Vietnam. And I think we probably, once I describe this picture, hard to show it to you over the radio, but 
when we get the Facebook page up, we could probably put these yeah, pictures on the Facebook could. page. But, but you'll, um, you'll know what Yeah, what picture this is. is a picture of a South Vietnamese general uh, with a pistol raised to a, another, uh, at that time, a, a Viet Cong, a suspected Viet, Viet, Viet Cong sympathizer, and um, pulling the trigger. And Eddie Adams captured that whole sequence leading up to his uh, death, killing. And, um, uh, but he won the Pulitzer for that in 1969. And Eddie, he desperately wanted to win a Pulitzer, but he really regretted um, that that is the photo that one of the South Vietnamese general execu- executing a Viet Cong guerrilla. Um, but that person was suspected of having killed several Americans. And a quote from Eddie Adams is, uh, Eddie had this to say, the general killed the Viet Cong, I killed the general with my camera. Still photographs are the most powerful weapon in the world. People believe them. But photographs do lie, even without manipulation. They're only half-truths. What the photographs didn't say was, what would you do if you were the general at that time and place on that hot day, and you caught the so-called bad guy after he blew away two or three American people. Eddie actually uh, later went on to personally apologize to that general for taking the photo and having destroyed the general's life. So no matter how you feel about the photo, that single image changed the world, and it changed Eddie Adams' entire career. So that was uh, that, that was uh, 1968. February 1, and uh, he took that, yep. 45 years ago. 45 years ago, he took that Pulitzer Prize winning photo. Um, the uh, the second photographer that, uh, what, did any of you have a comment on that? On that uh, particular that image? particular thing, yeah. or a- Eddie Adams. Lou, you had some things to say yeah. earlier. Yeah, I did, because I uh, was actually talking with Ted, and I said that, you know, it's amazing the power that the photojournalists had in terms of their ability to show Americans what that war was about. Mm -hmm. Before that, World War II, Korea, and so on, since then, they don't have as much power because everything is cleaned up. Mm -hmm. For some reason in Vietnam, they let it go, and these guys were just there on their own and recording what was happening. Yeah, You know, I've talked to several of them that were there, and one Pulitzer winner himself about the fact that he just had a couple of drivers with guns and they'd get in a jeep and go off to see what they could shoot. And a lot of times they would get shot themselves. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah there were quite a few journalists that uh, that died in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, they, um, yeah, I mean, basically it was if you could catch a ride on a jeep or, you know, you paid for a taxi or a private jeep, um, they would drive you where you wanted. And, uh, you know, now everything is, uh, as, as Lou said, cleaned up, but it's, you know, everything, you're, you're an embedded photographer. You literally have to be approved to yeah. you know, yeah. buy well, the military. You have to go through to, the censorship today. Right. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, um, and basically there was no censorship then. And, um, but um, uh, different time, different era. But oh, uh, yeah. that certainly changed American opinion on the war or, or, uh, or, 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 or helped in the change. Um, but in my mind, another powerful image of that same era um, which was the picture taken at Kent State mm-hmm. of the young woman um, oh, yeah. leaning over in anguish as uh, you know after the Ohio National Guard had shot four students. Mm-hmm. Uh, several of them were just walking between classes, mm-hmm. and um, uh, the woman that was bending over she was actually a 14-year-old runaway. But that was a Pulitzer Prize-winning photo mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So they had a lot of impact in changing. Uh, the course of that war. The other photographer that I want to um, look back on in history um, is a uh, kind of a living legend uh, in the world of photography, Brazilian photographer Sebastião Salgado, whose birthday was February 8th, just two days ago. Two days ago. Yep. Um, He's built a long-term career around, um, uh, you know, these, these long projects that he comes up with. Uh, and it seems that each one is more impressive than the last. But uh, Salgado was born in um, uh, Brazil on February 8th, 1944. Um, he uh, didn't start out to be a photographer. He actually has a master's degree in economics. 
from the uh, University of Sao Paulo. And he gave up that career uh, in about 1973 and started uh, becoming a photographer. And many people credit that with why some of his images may be so powerful is that he had kind of a career even before photography. He had this background um, as an as a economist. Um, and so uh, um, this has kind of given him a, a unique perspective to the world. It's helped him connect with his subjects on a, on a very personal level. If you look at the easiest way to see some of Salgado's stuff is to go to Google um, type in the name uh, Salgado, S A L G A D O, and then click on the images link, mm -hmm. and you'll see a number of his. But um, um, he's kind of dedicated his life to uh, helping and chronicling the uh, the lives of the uh, the depressed, the sick, the ill, um, uh, starving. You know, anywhere there's a there's a famine or pestilence, disease. You know, Salgado is there. He's done a lot of work for the United Nations. Um, his works are published both in books and galleries. And uh, a quote that I found on him was, um, as he talked about people and what he hopes his images will do, he had this to say, I hope the person who visits my exhibitions and the person who comes out of the exhibition are not quite the same. Mm -hmm. And so he's just trying to uh, uh, change the world. Through and, photography. And doing a good job. I think so. Yeah. And um, so each week, be sure to listen in as we uh, highlight an important event that happened in the past week in mm -hmm. the history of photography. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to take a minute to uh, talk about one of the show's supporters, Smug Mug. Smug Mug is the premier photo hosting site on the web, and they offer multiple levels of hosting from amateur to pro. They have a free two-week trial, and it does not require a credit card. They have packages starting at just $5 a month, and you can use our picture, this, slash FCCP listener discount to save an additional 20%. Use promo code TA13, all uppercase and no spaces, to receive your 20% discount. Check out all the Smug Mug services at SmugMug.com and use code TA13 to get your 20% discount. Yep. They are uh, they're, they're a great organization. Um, their customer service is uh, literally 24-7, um, yeah. 365 days a year. If you have a problem with your Smug Mug website on Christmas Day, believe it or not, you can call and you'll get a live person. Wow. So, yeah. pretty, pretty phenomenal in uh, today's age. Yeah, we, you don't find that anymore. Yep. A lot. Um, we've got another uh, email, but before we go to that, I want to let listeners know that they can call in locally at 727-441-3000 and toll-free 866-826-1340, and uh, we'll be happy to take your calls there. But I've got an email, um, and this is from uh, one of our uh, uh, listeners, Karen. And she wants to know if we know about a certain Canon uh, scanner. It's a Canon MG2120. She says it scans, it copies, it prints. Uh, very nice color images. Claims to be a photo level printer, especially since it has a downloadable easy photo print software program, which also seems to be like a kind of Photoshop program. The easy web print software program, though, does not work on Macs. The, she's definitely using a Mac. Uh, she's talking about operating system 10.7, Lion, or Safari 5.1. And she wants to know, it would be helpful since I could scan and copy, but is it a high photo level printer? Do we know? Hmm. Mm. So um, I've, I've uh, quick popped that into the... Uh, uh, my computer and I pulled it up on uh, Canon's website. It's a Pixma MG2110. Um, there's software available, drivers and software for it. Um, so you can use it as a scanner. Uh, they've got software up for 10.8, which is Mountain Lion, their current version. Um, they've got drivers for it and such. Um, their easy print software, I see a version for. Um, uh, 10 point, it says 10.8 here. Um, so maybe what you want to do, Karen, is 
head to the Canon site and um, up at the top where it says uh, the very top of their page. So it's um, their website is www.usa.canon.com. Go there, click on the top of the page, very top of the page at the link that says Support and Drivers, and then you can search for the MG2120, and you'll see a, a, a box where it says Drivers and Software, and you can go through the various software and download it. But um, So you should be able to get it scanning. That shouldn't be a problem. And there appear to be modern current drivers for it, so you can get it printing. But the real question is, is it a photo-quality printer? And I think that evolves to what do you, um, uh, what do you want to call photo-quality? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff, we had a caller a little bit earlier who uh, did not want to be on the air, but she said she uses Adobe Illustrator and wants to know if we've used it. Any of us have used it. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Um, Adobe Illustrator is uh, um, great for um, designing uh, brochures. Um, you could do a magazine in it, but yeah. Adobe has InDesign now, which is actually a little better. But um, I used to use it in my business. Yeah. And I designed all of our brochures, all of our business cards, you know, it's easier to do in Illustrator. I can do it in Photoshop, but if my business was a design or graphics business, I would be using Illustrator, using Photoshop to adjust the pictures, and then you know they seamlessly go. I, I can take that picture from Photoshop right into Illustrator, mm -hmm. and you know lay out the business cards and do all those things. And um, so Illustrator's great, but it's really not a uh, photography program. Right. It's more of a graphics. It's a drawing program, I think. Yeah, in the old days, we used to call them structured drawing programs. Yeah. But AutoCAD, freehand. Yeah. Not AutoCAD. Not but, AutoCAD. But, no. um, yeah, that's what I'm trying yeah. to think of, yeah. But um, um, produces uh, extremely high-quality graphics. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. But back to Karen's question. She was asking about photo-quality printing. So mm. um, uh, I would say that that's probably not a photo-quality printer, Karen. Um the uh, um, uh, it's only a four color printer. Yeah, it's it it can do uh, photos. It could do a good four by you six. You really maybe. need to get into the six color uh, printers at a minimum to get really nice flesh tones and and really accurate colors. Mm -hmm. But to print some four by sixes and some family photos, flesh tones may not be great, but it certainly will be sharp and and look good. In that respect, mm -hmm. yeah, um, it would be okay. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a it's a modestly priced. You know, it's 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 one of those um, packages. When you buy the computer, get a free printer after rebate. That's the kind of printer that that we would give away with those. I, I just bought a um, an Epson all in one printer. Yeah. Actually, it's a, it's the Workforce eight forty five, and and the reason we bought it at our house was uh, because we needed something wireless. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've printed some four by sixes with a four yeah. color, and, and they look okay. And they're they look, they're yeah. fine. They're yeah. sharp. They're clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No grain or or anything. I mean, as far as the resolution, you know, yeah. you just have to. And my everyday printer is a four color Canon printer that was pretty much one of those kit type of uh, printers. And at the same time, it's an everyday printer. And once in a while, if I want to pop something in, I can. Um, but. Uh, Really, ultimate quality or getting there? Eh, not quite, but uh, it'll do a nice job. Yeah. All righty. Uh, sounds like we have time for maybe one more question. Maybe one. Maybe we got one. one? More. Uh, another one just popped into the How about that? mailbox. Uh, this is from Tom, and Tom wants to know. And I think I think I know who Tom is. I think he's actually listening up in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Oh, wow! So he's probably. I don't think our signal gets quite that far. Oh, he's probably I, I, doing uh, a stream. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's listening on the Internet. I don't know how I know that. But Tom, Tom wants to know, as a nature photographer, what are the reasons, if any, to go to a full sensor camera? And he says he currently shoots a Canon 7D. Mm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Well, that's a tough one because, you know, as a nature photographer, you benefit from that bump with the 1.5 multiplication factor on the lens. 
your 300 millimeter lens has the effect of of a 450 on a full frame chip right mm-hmm. and and that's a nice benefit that we've benefited from the last 10 years or better mm-hmm. and i think uh, the larger chips tend to reduce the noise a little bit yeah they do so that would uh, that be would be a benefit to the full frame sure yeah. it it can be when you but when you take a full frame image and you crop into it to get the same size right. or field of view that you have on the uh, crop, um, you'd be surprised how, how noisy when you start dropping out uh-huh. the pixels it starts to become. Yeah. But um, I think there's really two classes of photographers that um, for a time to come, um, there'll be a need for uh, these crop sensors. And the first are wildlife photographers. If When you say nature, if you're mostly a landscape photographer, I think you are going to benefit from the full frame, um, lower noise levels, better dynamic range, some things like that. But if you truly are a wildlife photographer, you're shooting birds and bears and bees and lions and tigers and bears, oh my, um, or... You're a sports photographer. Yeah. Those are the two classifications of photographers that, what I like to term, they're reach limited. Yeah. Um, you can put longer and longer telephoto lenses on, but there just comes a point. You just can't walk onto the football field. You can't walk onto the baseball playing field. You can only get so close to a bird before it'll fly off. Mm-hmm. And yeah. having that extra reach... Uh, as Lou pointed out, yeah. um, that really benefits the wildlife, uh, separating that from nature, meaning landscape and wildlife. And I think that's that's where you're going. So, uh, Tom, I uh, you know uh, I, I don't know all the wildlife, but I know, as I recall in the past, you've you've been to Circle B with some photographers from Atlanta. Uh, he brought a group down last year. This is the Tom I'm thinking of. Uh, brought a group of photographers from Atlanta down to Circle B over near Lakeland, and uh, they spent a weekend down there. But um, 7D is a great camera, and um, I think it's replacement. Uh, I don't have any inside information on that, but uh, the 7D is due to be replaced. And I, I think Canon's got something up their sleeve, and I think the 7D Mark II is going to be the wildlife sports shooter's camera um, for a couple of years mm-hmm. once they get that mm-hmm. on the market. Mm-hmm. So we're getting a signal that it's almost time to go. and um, About one so minute to about, go. About a minute. And so next week we've got some fun things to talk about. Yeah, next week we're going to talk about what do you do with your pictures once you take them. Yep. And um, what's, you know, how do you, how do you process them and what, what type of workflow yeah, and uh, you know that's that's the comes under the general heading of what I like to call what's known in the industry as DAM, Digital, Digital Asset, Asset Management. Management. Yep, and so next week we'll be answering questions about uh, storing your pictures, managing your pictures. We'll be talking about software again, but this time on the organizational end of it, we'll be taking your calls, and you'll be able to uh, uh, email us your questions. And, you know, thanks for stopping and and giving us a listen. We'll see you next week, but we really appreciate those of us, those of you that uh, have called in or emailed in to help this. Thanks. I'm I'm surprised I didn't get a call from Taylor Swift, you know. (laughs) Could happen next week. (laughs) Could be. So for Ted Froberg, Lou Donald, and myself, uh, thank you. And listen in next week to Picture This. Thank you.